Boys and girls, you're dismissed to Children's Church. If you'd like to make your way over to the side there where you see Terry and Thomas and follow them. While they're being dismissed, I'd like to say a, a thank you to Joel Corrales and to John Copenall and to Luke Waddy for uh, taking the services while my wife and I went up to Alabama to visit our daughter. I appreciate those men very much. They do a wonderful job. Uh, they love the Word of God. They love Jesus, and, and they're good at sharing the Word, aren't they? In fact, I noticed attendance was up last Sunday while I was gone. <laughs> So, John, I've got to have you preach more often <laughs> because you and Joel and, and Luke. So, no, thank you. I, I appreciate the men that God has sent our way that are gifted and that know the Word and love the Word and are able to teach the Word. I, I, Gary Ingersoll has been doing that for years here in the adult Sunday school class, and I always appreciate going in and listening to him uh, teach. And, of course, John, John's on uh, here every Wednesday night and oftentimes shares with us some, some of his lessons from life and uh, some of the neat sayings he's had. He's memorized these sayings over the years, I think, and, and he's always sharing that with us. And, and so uh, you would be blessed as well, I think, to if you're not attending one of the adult Bible study classes, to join one. Uh, it's a good time to learn in, more, in a more informal setting uh, the Word of God. And then join us on Wednesday nights as well as, as we pray for our church and pray for each other, uh, pray for the various ministries, and then also uh, dig into the Word of God. I hope, I hope that you can get involved if you're not involved in those services. I also want to encourage you to invite someone next Sunday for Easter Sunday morning. It's a wonderful time of celebrating the resurrection, uh, but not only is it a celebration for those of us who know Jesus, it's also a chance to share the most important message in the world, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that men and women, boys and girls, can be saved through trusting in Jesus. And I will be sharing the gospel on Easter Sunday morning. And so I would encourage you, sometimes people will go on Easter and Christmas. Uh, in fact, sometimes that's the only time some people go. Uh, but I would encourage you, invite somebody to come. They might be willing to do so on Easter. And then invite them to stay for the breakfast afterwards to get to know uh, some of the people here at Grace. Well, this morning I'm going to take a little different twist than the normal Palm Sunday message. I want to talk about what to do when your world is turned upside down. What to do when something happens that just sort of blasts you, uh, that takes you by surprise, or that shocks you, or that you don't know quite exactly how to handle. Because that, in a sense, is what happened during that final week of Jesus' life here on earth, beginning with Palm Sunday and ending with the resurrection. On what we call Palm Sunday, a couple thousand years ago, Jesus came riding into Jerusalem amid the shouts and praises of so many of the Jewish pilgrims that had flocked to Jerusalem for the Passover in obedience to the Old Testament teaching. No doubt the twelve disciples were skipping with joy at this time. I mean, they've been following and sacrificing for Jesus for twelve years. Remember, they had left their homes. They had left their vocation. I mean, they were basically living off of the generosity of other people. And how they managed to support their family during that time, I don't know, because we do know some of them were married. So I don't know how they did that exactly. Maybe, maybe there were enough gifts given, or maybe there was enough time in between their various ministry uh, activities that they could go back to work for uh, momentarily and make enough money for their families to survive. But you remember uh, when uh, they were talking to Jesus on one occasion, the disciples said, but Lord, we've left everything to follow you. We've left everything to follow you. And so what will we have as a result of following you? And you remember he said, I, I tell you the truth that no one has left homes or mother or brothers or sisters or, or families or anything that won't in this life and in the life to come receive a hundredfold and also eternal life. And so uh, these disciples, these 12 men who were following Jesus uh, were sacrificing. And they were hoping, they were hoping that sometime during the earthly ministry of Jesus, which is the only ministry that they saw, you remember on multiple occasions Jesus announced that he would be crucified, that he'd be turned over to sinful men, crucified, dead buried that he would rise from the dead and yet the disciples never got that they they didn't really even understand that until some of the post-resurrectional appearances when Jesus appeared in the midst of the room 
uh, as they gathered together in fear after his crucifixion. And so my guess is now, because they were anticipating the establishment of the Old Testament millennial kingdom, that the disciples were saying, this is it! This is it! Jesus is riding into Jerusalem. The pilgrims are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna to the king. And, and the disciples, uh, they're probably skipping for joy. Woo-hoo! Three and a half years, finally paid off! Woo-hoo! You know, <laughs> they gotta be. They may think of it. Uh, after all of that sacrifice, uh, uh, how many of us have ever given up three and a half years of work? Uh, three and a half years of, of hard ministry, of traveling with the Lord, of, of facing criticism from the religious establishment, establishment as well as those who didn't like Jesus that may not have been religious, uh, from suffering for Jesus. And, and now they think, hey, this is it. This is the end. All of our, all of our hard work, all of our sacrifices are going to pay off. Jesus is going to rule and reign. And, and I'm going to guess that some of them, like James and John, were still hoping to sit at the right and the left hand of Jesus when he came into his kingdom and when he established it. And so I, I'm going to guess they were skipping for joy. Everybody was skipping for joy on Palm Sunday. And then, and then they get to see Jesus go into the temple for a second time and overturn the tables of the dishonest money changers and chase some of them out with a homemade whip. It's an interesting statement, isn't it? Jesus made a whip and actually chased some of the people out of the temple. And the disciples again were probably saying, it's about time. Yeah, come on, Jesus. Give them a... <laughs> you know, let them have it. These guys have been causing us trouble the whole time. They've been, in, been interfering with your ministry Uh, They've been constantly opposing us, and finally, Jesus is doing something about it. I can hear some of them going, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh, we told you, Uh uh-huh, right? (laughs) To the leaders of the Pharisees and the scribes. Then Jesus also gives the Pharisees the seven woes in one of his discourses during this time between the triumphant entry and the crucifixion. In Matthew chapter 23, we read about those woes. And again, I'm going to guess the disciples were probably sitting back and maybe becoming a little smug and maybe even a little self-righteous. Yep, yep, give it to him, Jesus. Give it to him. Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. Woe to you, blind guides. You say if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold of the temple that, or the uh, temple that makes the gold sacred. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our forefathers, we would have not taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. You snakes, you uh, brood of vipers. How will you escape being condemned? to hell now I I, I don't know if at some point in in this discourse the disciples may have become a little more shocked at the way that Jesus spoke to the Pharisees I mean this is pretty harsh isn't it it's not the lovey dovey blonde haired wimpy looking blue eyed you know uh, Messiah that some people think of who could never say anything bad you could never hurt anybody's feelings you can never do anything that would be you know uh, demeaning to a person. Woe to you, woe to you, oh, hypocrites, 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 uh, whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, inside full of dead men's bones, full of greed and, and self-indulgence and etc., etc. 
but although they may have been maybe a little shocked by the harshness of Jesus' words again, no doubt they still had this joy inside of them as Jesus is beginning to assert himself in a powerful way. And they're seeing that the end is near, but the end for them is not the crucifixion. The end for them is the establishment of the millennial kingdom. That's all they could see because of the spiritual blindness that was clouding their vision in relationship to the crucifixion. Then, after some more teaching about the last days in the, kingdoms of heaven, in the kingdom of heaven, and after Jesus' anointing by the women at Bethany, they get to eat the Passover together. This is all during a one-week period. And day after day, they had to be thinking, it's got to be time. It's got to be time. Time for Jesus to be king. In fact, maybe they thought they were going to the garden with Jesus after the Passover meal to pray because it had something, maybe, maybe they were thinking that it had something to do with the inauguration of the kingdom. And maybe that's why they fell asleep. That they didn't see the urgency of the fact that Jesus was going to the cross, of the pain and the suffering that Jesus would, would go through for the sins of those who didn't even care about him. They were simply thinking of themselves. All of this time, they were thinking of themselves, thinking of themselves, what do I get out of this? Oh, oh boy, here, you know, I'm going to get to be a leader. I'm going to get to rule and reign. They, they didn't fully comprehend what was about to come, and so maybe, maybe again, that's why they were laxed in their prayers. And you remember when Jesus comes back and asks them to pray again, they didn't do too much better the second time, did they? Again, they fell asleep during their prayers. But then, then their world is rocked by something they really didn't see coming, even though they had been warned. A confusing event that perhaps might be the beginning of a war leading to Jesus' kingship or might just be another confrontation with those opposed to Jesus. A band of soldiers and religious leaders come to the garden that night and they were armed, armed with weapons, and they were looking for Jesus. And one, one of those who was leading the group was one of their own. It was Judas. And this is where we pick up with the events in the last week of Christ in Matthew chapter 26, verses 47 through 56. Would you turn there in your Bibles, please, as we look this morning more in-depth at this particular passage, this turning point, this point at which they began to realize something is going astray. Something isn't going according to plans, at least their plans. Everything was actually going according to plan to God's plan. But in their minds, they didn't know what in the world was happening. Their world was being rocked by the events of this evening. Matthew 26, beginning with verse 47. It says, While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer, that is Judas, had arranged a signal with them, that is, with the religious leaders. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? At that time Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. This has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we look at this pivotal point in the lives of the disciples, where confusion rocked their world, 
where the events of this night would change the way that they would see things forever. Where they didn't really know what to do and in response to this calamity, this disaster as they saw it, they fled for their very lives. They deserted the one they had followed for three and a half years. The one who, one of them said they would never desert. So Father, help us uh, to gain some insight into the situation and to learn from it and to learn what to do when something comes our way that rocks our world. Father, may we glean some principles from your word that will not only help us to know and love Jesus more, but will help us to live for him more as well. We ask for your help in doing this through the power of your indwelling Holy Spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. From Peter's perspective, his world was going to be turned upside down. And to, to this morning, as, as I deal with this particular topic, I'm, I'm primarily dealing it with, from Peter's perspective, not from Jesus's. Jesus knew that everything was going according to plan. His world wasn't turned upside down. He wasn't rocked by the events of that evening. This was a part of the plan of God from before the foundation of the world. The redemption of mankind through the sacrifice of the Son of God was planned before you and I were ever, ever in the, well, I can't say in the mind of God, but before our parents ever thought of us, before the world was ever made, before Adam and Eve were made. The Bible tells us from the very beginning, this was God's plan. And so Jesus' world wasn't rocked. But I'd like to look at it from the perspective of his followers, from his disciples, from people who were like you and I. We're not Jesus's, right? We're not little deities running around with the kind of knowledge that Jesus had. We don't know what the future holds for us. And so when things come into our life, oftentimes things that baffle us, it disturbs us and we become rocked by it and we don't know how to respond. And so maybe, maybe we can learn a lesson from the disciples and their wrong response that will help us to respond better. The first thing I think that we can learn from Peter's response and from the response of the other disciples is do not automatically resort to violence when something rocks your world. In verse 47 it says, While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived with him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. Now look at Jesus' response to Judas. Does that strike you as being a little bit strange? Friend? friend do what you came for did Jesus know what Judas was doing did he know why all of these men were there armed with clubs and swords absolutely and yet he says to him friend friend that strikes me as being a little bit odd other than it's the son of God who's speaking here now the word friend is not the Greek word philos, which is the Greek word for an endeared friend, uh, someone that you love deeply, uh, someone that, that you would consider maybe very special to you. Instead, of, it's more of a, a general word for friend, a word, a good equivalent, which we don't use much uh, in, in the uh, English language, in America anyways, because of its association maybe with the Cold War era. Uh, a good, a good modern-day equivalent, though, would be comrade, comrade a partner, an associate, someone, someone who you've worked with side by side for a purpose. In the, in the Russian uh, military, they would call each other comrade because they were soldiers together working uh, for a purpose. And, and that's more of the idea here, but that's still a nice term. I, don't, I wouldn't greet somebody who was coming to have me arrested, who was falsely uh, betraying me uh, un under the guise of a kiss. What a hypocritical action. Uh, would you greet them with friend? I would say, okay, okay, you, you dirty, rotten scoundrel, go ahead and do what you came to do. <laughs> but Jesus treats him with respect. He treats him with respect. Rather than responding with anger, rather than getting upset at Judas, rather than 
yelling at him and screaming at him and, and, and you know, maybe rightfully lecturing him. He simply says, friend, do what you came for. Just a little while earlier in Matthew chapter 16, we read that Jesus had actually referred to Peter as Satan. Let me read it to you. Matthew 16, verse 22, it says, Peter took him aside, that is, took Jesus aside, and began to rebuke him. This is after Jesus said that he, he had to be turned over to the hands of sinful men and crucified. It, it, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned to him and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Wow! I mean, he says, says to Judas, friend, do what you have to do. To Peter, he says, get behind me, Satan. Now, if I was Peter standing there, do you think you might have some ill will toward the way that Jesus greeted Judas? Hey, Jesus, I mean, that's a little nice compared to what you said to me. Why'd you pick on me? And, and we all know that he wasn't really referring to Peter as the actual literal Satan, but that instead that he was doing the will of Satan, even though he thought he was doing something good by protecting the Lord. He was actually doing the will of Satan, and we recognize that it was Satan that was motivating him, Satan that was behind all of it, and Jesus was really addressing that. But still, he looked at him, and I mean, what if I looked at one of you and said, hey, get behind me, Satan, for you don't fav savor the things of God, but, but of men. And, and then if you turn around and the guy that comes to betray him, you, you treat him with more kindness than he treated his own disciples. Whenever your world is being rocked, when you're facing some undue pressure or criticism or being attacked by people you thought were your friends, do not resort to violence. Do not resort to malicious behavior. In fact, don't respond out of anger. The Bible says that the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. But how often do our feelings begin to boil and we start to rise up and we get mad and we get angry and if we don't do anything wrong, we think something wrong. And we develop ill will towards somebody. I, I don't even see ill will here toward Judas. I see pity. I see sympathy for him. He knows what Judas is going to do. And he realized Judas is making the most tragic mistake of his life. And he looks beyond the betrayal. He looks beyond what's happening to him to the greater purpose. And, and, and my guess is he still desired for Judas to come to salvation, even though he knew he wouldn't because he said, have I not chosen 12 of you and yet one of you is the devil? Jesus knew that Judas would never come to actual faith. And yet, I'm going to bet that he was hoping, even though he knew he wouldn't, and I know he could change things, and you say, why would he hope for something that doesn't happen? Because of love. That He knew that Judas would never come to faith, but was hoping he would. Remember when Jesus cried over Jerusalem? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that stonest the prophets? He had, a, he had an unending love for people despite the fact that this Jerusalem was going to turn against him and crucify him. He did not allow his anger to rule his attitude, but he allowed love to overcome all of the potentially ill will that a person can feel. He was respectful to Peter and didn't get mad at him. He was respectful to Judas and didn't get mad to him, and yet spoke straightforward to both of them. Jesus didn't strike Judas as he came up to kiss him. I, you know, if, if it was you and you were being wrongly accused and you were going to be arrested and you knew that you were going to die because of that, uh, what would you be tempted to do to the person who came up and then kissed you with such a... With, I mean, this, that's an endearing... I don't care where you are, what culture you're in. The Middle East, Italy. <laughs> I was talking to a Cuban couple uh, from Hope uh, the other day, and they mentioned a lot of Cuban people, Hispanics the same way. They kiss each other a lot. And, and they kiss people. It's an endearing action, right? And, and yet he's doing that in order to betray him. I, I'd be, I, you'd be thinking that maybe Jesus would give him a little pop for it, right? 
as Judas came up and goes like this, Jesus just smacks him right in the lips. Boom, pop. Gives him a couple bloody lips to walk away with and think about. No, that's us. That's us. That's not Jesus. We tend to respond with hatred. We tend to respond with malice. We tend to respond with violence. We tend to react rather than be calm. And I think the scriptures would teach us to follow the example of Jesus and to sit back and be calm. And to think about what is happening before you respond to what is happening. Uh, to find out or to understand Jesus understood all the facts. Jesus knew everything about why what was happening was happening. But we don't. And, and so we need to be careful about making judgments or assessments without knowing everything. Now in the process of talking about not responding automatically with violence, I'm not ruling out self-defense. I've said that before. I do, I do believe that the Bible allows for self-defense. And I'm not dis dismissing, <laughs> dismissing or diminishing. I wanted to say those two words. Dismissing or diminishing the role of government in punishing the evildoer. What I am saying is that as individuals, we ought not to respond or react to a situation that rocks our world or that shocks us or that makes us think, what's going on with violence or with hatred or with malice, but instead with love. Secondly, the second thing we ought to do when something rocks our world is to pray. Just before the men came to arrest Jesus, the last thing that happens before this group comes to arrest Jesus is that Jesus had asked them to pray. And I think he asked them to pray as much for their sakes, in fact, maybe I think more for their sakes than for his own. Now, we know it was a difficult time because in, in his kenosis, in his emptying of himself, as in Jesus' taking on of humanity, he was subject to pain just like you and I are subject to pain. And he knew the crucifixion was not going to be pleasant. And I, I think he would have appreciated their prayers for what he was about to go through and asked them to pray, and no doubt that was a part of what he wanted them to pray for. But I think that maybe, maybe, I think it's warranted that he wanted them to pray more for themselves that they wouldn't desert him on this occasion, even though they knew that they, they would. And they failed. They failed to pray. How often does something rock our world where we do respond with violence or malice or hatred rather than praying? When was the last time when something really shocked you or took you by surprise or, or just blew you away that you said, hey, let's stop and pray? We, we fail to do that. Or when we do pray about a situation, it's a short, quick little prayer as we fall asleep. <laughs> like, to, don't, I, I'm not trying to get down on anyone. The, the disciples did the same thing. They were human. In fact, I find comfort in their humanity. They fell asleep at one of the most crucial periods of time in the life of the Savior. And so if we fall asleep in something that's not quite so crucial, okay, <laughs> you know, maybe it's the wrong thing to take comfort in. But we really, we really should be more careful to pray. We should respond first with prayer. I'm afraid that prayer does not hold the place that it ought to hold in the lives of most Christians, including many in our, in our church. I think all of us ought to be more involved in prayer than we are. And I don't know how much anyone prays. I'm just speaking in terms of, in general terms. But I'm going to guess we... We don't pray as much as we ought to. And I, I think even of Wednesday nights, and I know people work, but prayer meetings at 7. We pray for each other. We pray for special needs. And, and yet attendance is so, so minuscule on Wednesday nights. But, but when something goes wrong in our own lives, I get a phone call almost immediately. Pastor Dean, can you pray for this? Can you pray for this? Can you... So people know that there's power in prayer. People understand that prayer is important. But why is it that it's only important when, it, when something's going wrong in our life? Why is it that we don't want to bother taking time out of our busy schedules to go and pray with others for others? I'm, I'm not sure why. I, I do think that maybe a lot of the excuses that people offer are invalid excuses. I've heard some people say, well, it's boring to pray. Yeah, Jesus didn't make it a whole lot more exciting, did he? <laughs> 
His disciples fell asleep. Remember that. It's boring because we don't believe in it. It's boring because we don't recognize the power of it. When I say believe in it, everybody, everybody mentally assents to it. But if we really believed it, wouldn't we be praying more? The third thing that we need to do in a crisis situation or when something rocks our world is to ask ourselves, am I seeking to do a good thing that is wrong to do? Did you catch that? Am I seeking to do a good thing that is wrong to do? Listen again to, to verse 50 here. Jesus replied, friend, do what you came for. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions... Now, it doesn't tell us in Matthew, Mark, or Luke who that companion was. I don't know if you've noticed that. It does not tell us who the companion was, and it does not name the person of whose ear that companion cut off. There's a reason for that. It's a reason that many of us don't recognize. The reason is this. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were all written fairly early in relationship to the writings of the New Testament. Those three Gospels were written long before John wrote his Gospel. You see, John names both the companion. He's the one who identifies that it was Peter who drew his sword and cut off the ear. And John also names the victim, Malchus, the servant of the high priest. But you see, he does so, John does so, after Peter is already dead. If he would have said something about who it was that drew his sword and who it was that he struck, he just gave the authorities all the facts to go and arrest Peter. What? You cut off the ear of somebody? Now they got a legitimate reason, not just for being a disciple of Jesus, but he committed a criminal action. And so Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't name the perpetrator on purpose. So I think, I think, it never says anywhere, but I think to protect Peter while he was still alive. John names him. Why? Because by the time John writes his gospel later on, 90-something A.D., Peter is already dead. It doesn't matter if you say, you can tell about all of his crimes and it doesn't matter at that point. Nobody's going to arrest the dead. But he says, put back, put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? So Jesus rebukes Peter for seeking to defend him with the sword. Now, isn't that a good thing to defend your friend? Isn't that a good thing to defend the Savior, the creator of the world? I mean, hey, I'm surprised that not it was only Peter that stepped up. They had at least two swords. Remember Luke chapter 22? Luke chapter 22, Jesus said, uh, I told you before to go without a purse and go without a cloak and go without the... He says, now I'm telling you to buy a cloak uh, or to go and sell your cloak and buy a sword if you don't have one. And, and one of them, I think it was Peter, that actually responded in Luke 22 and said, uh, we have two swords. Jesus said, that's enough. Why were they to buy swords? I, I think, again, for self-defense. Not, not for protecting them from people who want to harass and harm them when they're preaching the gospel. We do not... We, uh, in those cases... You give, I think you give yourself up to the will of God. You can flee, you can run, but you don't attack the people you're witnessing to. That's, I think, self-defeating to the gospel message. But if a mugger is coming, if somebody breaks into your home, you can defend yourself. And, and so it was a legitimate reason to have a sword. But it also comes into play here because that very weapon that Jesus gave him permission to have is the very weapon that he used. So it wasn't wrong that Peter had a sword. That's what I'm trying to point out. It wasn't wrong that Peter had a sword. What was wrong is that Peter, in his attempts to do something very, very, very good, actually did something very wrong. It was wrong for two reasons. First of all, because Jesus had clearly taught that his kingdom was not of this world. In John 18, verse 36, Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. Jesus, they didn't have to fight for Jesus. Jesus can take care of himself. In fact, that's what Jesus basically said. Peter, 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 Peter. Don't you know that I can call 12 legions of angels? There's, what, 6,000? 6, 6,000 soldiers and a Roman legion. So 6 times 12, 70, 72, 
thousand angels. Now, it only took one angel. Remember, it only took one angel to destroy 180-some thousand Assyrian soldiers. One angel, one angel, when Assyria surrounded Jerusalem back in the days of King Hezekiah, one angel struck down in one night 180,000. Imagine, imagine what 72,000 could do. <laughs> All the legions of Rome could come against Jesus. And these angels would be more than capable of handling it. And that's what Jesus is saying to Peter. Peter, I don't need you to defend me. You know, one of the main differences between, and I heard somebody preaching on this recently on Moody, one of the main differences between Christianity and Islam is that we don't need to defend Jesus' honor. I, when I say that, I mean physically. We don't have to go to war against the unsaved who may draw cartoons of Jesus. We don't have to pick up our guns and start shooting the atheists because they mock Jesus. See, in Islam, they have to defend Muhammad. Why? Because Muhammad isn't capable of defending himself. Jesus is more than capable of defending himself. More than capable of de defending himself. And, and so he says that to Peter. Peter, put away your sword. If I didn't want this to happen, it wouldn't happen as simple as that. Secondly, the second reason why what Peter did was wrong, even though it seems to be a very, very good thing, is because Jesus had to go to the cross. That was a part of the plan. That was what he had announced to them on several occasions that they didn't comprehend. Back in Matthew 16 again, verse 21, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Jesus had told them that several times, and they didn't get it. And so as we look at this situation, what we have to realize is that we can do something that's good that is actually wrong. You say, give me an example of that. Well, in early America, when the Puritans first came to this country, they established colonies and townships that they wanted governed by the law of God, by the teachings of the Bible. And in the process of doing that, they set up laws that would punish people for not doing certain religious activities. Now, I'm glad of the faith of our founding fathers, and, I, and it's greatly impacted our nation in a very positive way, but some of the things they attempted to do, I actually think were wrong, even though they had good intentions and they were good things. You ought to go to church. And, and is, how many agree with that? You ought to, doesn't the Bible teach that? Hebrews teaches, Hebrews chapter 10, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. That's a good thing. So what did the Puritans do? They said, if you don't go to church, we're going to fine you. In some of the early colonies, they put them in stocks for 24 hours. You know what that is, right? That's the thing that looks like a, a yoke that they close over your, your, your neck and your hands like this in the public square. They would literally go to the home of the person who didn't come to church, drag them to the public square, and lock them up for 24 hours. That happened in early America. And so they were by force trying to get people to do what was good. They were trying to do what was good, but what they were doing was wrong. You cannot force people into the kingdom of God. You cannot force people into obeying Scripture for the right reasons. And so there were people who were seeking to do good, but in the process did wrong. Another, I think, modern-day example. I think uh, some of you are going to hate me for this. Young people's support of gun control because of wanting to stop school gun violence. Now, is it a good thing to stop school gun violence? Absolutely. Will gun control do it? I don't think so. Unless they totally ban weapons altogether. That's the only way that it's going to make a dent in any of it, I think. And I don't believe that they ought to have the right to do that because our Constitution gave us that right so that these young people could do exactly what they're doing, protest. Because at one time in other countries, had there not been in America, if they would have protested the way they protested, they'd be locked up for that. They wouldn't have the very right to protest what they're seeking to do away with that gave them the freedom in the first place. It was an armed citizenry that went against Great Britain and threw off the tyranny and the abuses of that country. And yet our young people don't recognize that. What they're seeking to do is good, but gun control is not going to do it. What will do it is reformation of the heart. What will help do it is if they go back to their classes and befriend those people who are the outcasts 
if they sit at the lunch table with the person who sits by themselves, if they talk to the person who's been isolated by everyone because he's a little goofy, he's a little odd, he's a nerd, if they speak to, with, to others with kindness, you know what, I'm going to guess that would do more to prevent school shootings than all of the gun control in the world. If the young people would simply recognize, if I treated these people who I don't necessarily care for better, then maybe they wouldn't want to kill me. Right? I mean, who wants to kill their friends? Who wants to kill their... I mean, how many of these mass murderers shot their girlfriends? Right? You know, somebody that they loved. We need to show love. Our young people need to show love. What they want is good, but the way that they're doing it, I think, is wrong. Another example might be poor people who steal to feed their families or try to justify that. Now, I don't think that happens very often, but it may happen in some situations. And the Bible says, do not despise a thief if he steals to feed his family. Did you know that? In Proverbs. It says, do not despise. It doesn't say he can't be punished by the authorities. It says, do not despise him if he does it to feed his family. They're seeking to do something good, but they're going about it in the wrong way. They're doing something wrong and seeking to do good. Another example uh, might be parents who rescue their children out of every problem or bad situation, thus diminishing the consequences of their bad choices. We, we see that all the time. Or churches. Churches that fudge on certain biblical topics or teachings to attract or keep more people. It's good. They want more people in church. Why? So they can hear the Word of God. But if you're fudging... If you're fudging on the teachings of Scripture to do that, you're doing something wrong. What about couples who use pornography to spice up their marriage? Does anyone do that? Yes. Did you know there are marriage counselors that recommend that? I have read that in articles. Where their love life has diminished. There are some counselors who actually say, well, why don't you view pornography together? And maybe that'll help arouse the two of you and, and make your love life a little better. Is it good to make your love life better? Yeah, it's okay to say that. Yes, yes, it is okay. You're married. Most of you are married out here. Yes, it is. It's okay. It's good to want to have a, a, a healthy, good marriage and a loving and intimate, intimate marriage. But you don't do something like view pornography, which is clearly forbidden by the teachings of Scripture, in order to do that. Even, even not going to church to spend time with family can be one of those examples. Somebody who says, you know, I work, I work six days a week and Sunday's the only day off, so I, I stay home with my family and I spend... That's a good thing, but you're going about it, I think, in a wrong way. What you're doing is worse than if you were to go to church, maybe, and then go home and spend some good time with your family. And so there are all sorts of ways, there are all sorts of ways that we can seek to do good, but in the process actually do something wrong. Peter was seeking to do something good. Protect the Lord. Protect his friend. Protect the Savior. And yet it was clearly wrong. How do I know it's clearly wrong? Jesus said it was. Put away your sword, Peter. Fourthly and finally, what do you do when you're faced with a crisis? Well, you, again, you don't automatically resort to violence. You pray. You ask yourself, am I seeking to do a good thing that is wrong to do? And finally, you must keep a thoroughly biblical perspective. Had Peter, had Peter had a more biblical mindset, had he recognized the truth not only of the teachings of Jesus, but also of the Old Testament, he would have known that Christ had to go to the cross. Psalm 22, 16 says, Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men have encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. That's an Old Testament reference to the crucifixion. Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5 is another Old Testament reference to the crucifixion. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Daniel 9, 26, after the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off. Cut off and have nothing. Zechariah 12.10 And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. The Old Testament taught the crucifixion, but they missed it. Jesus taught the crucifixion, but they missed it. Why did they miss it? They didn't have a thoroughly biblical mindset. You say, but they were disciples. Yes, but they were still in the learning process. 
It is possible for all of us to think wrongly about a subject if we don't think biblically, if we don't search the scriptures daily to see whether those things be so. For us, the crucifixion is the central point of the life of Jesus. Actually, the resurrection, but the crucifixion had to come first. It led up to that. To us, it seems so obvious as we look at the scriptures and we can see it. But to them, they missed it. Sometimes when you're in the midst of a crisis, when you're in the midst of a difficult situation, when something rocks your world, you miss what the scriptures teach about that something. Have a thoroughly biblical mindset, which implies study. You won't develop a thoroughly biblical mindset just from the teaching you receive here on Sunday morning. I'd like to say you would. <laughs> and maybe it can be the impetus for you to start that. But you need to be studying on your own at home. You need to be memorizing and meditating on the Word. All of the events were leading up to the crucifixion. And yet it was one of his own disciples. Not the bad guy, but the good guy who sought to stop it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, it's easy to see in the life of Peter that it's possible to act in a way that is 